Well, hey there, Mega Maniacs, and welcome back to another product unboxing and review, I guess. Because today, the Analog NT Mini Noir version 2, or V2, whichever they actually mean by that, arrived at my doorstep. Now, I had actually bought this item once before, or should I say attempted to buy it, because I had it in my cart when they made a limited quantity of it available, and by the time I got through the checkout, the item was no longer available. But when they released their restock of the Super NT, they promised, quote unquote, one last run of the NT Mini Noir version two, and this time I was actually able to get through the checkout with it in my cart, and here it is. Believe you me, I'm stunned by this one because I thought it would sell out as fast as the last batch did, but somehow it survived in my cart, even as I sat there in queue waiting for the confirmation on shipping and handling cost. And as I said with the Super NT, I did not mind paying $26 for shipping versus paying an eBay scalper and letting them get all the money instead of analog. With the money to go to the people who deserve it, even if their shipping prices are a little high. But for your money, what you get in here is very impressive. I'm not saying that lightly because this is not a light purchase. If you did have the opportunity to buy it when there was a restock, or if you're getting one on the secondary market, you're going to spend at least $500. I know, I know, I know, that's a deal breaker for a lot of people. And I'm not going to say you're wrong if you feel that way, but when you take this thing out of the box, it is one solid piece of aluminum brushed steel, and it has every input and output conceivable on the back, up to and including HDMI, which the only other NES or NES clone I can think of that has that kind of feature is the Retro AVS, which is only $189 by comparison, or $199, but this does come with every single kind of plug you would need, European, Japanese, North American, and an 8-bit dough controller, so that's a pretty good value in and of itself. Now allow me to set up the camera and get a proper angle here, adjusting it so it's hopefully centered and balanced a little bit. So I've already set up the NT Mini Noir on my coffee table. I have a nice long extension cord HDMI. I know people say the signal degrades if you use too long of a cable, but I didn't find that to be my experience while testing this. As you can see, there are four standard NES controller ports on the front, so you can do four player games without using a four player tap. And I chose to plug the 8-bit Doe controller into port one and use it wirelessly. But you can use any original NES controller you like. You can use the Advantage Pro, you can use the standard square, you can use any knockoff third party one that you want to. It's all available to you. If it fits in the standard pin connector, it will work on the NT Mini Noir. Now, if you jailbreak this thing, it is a freaking powerhouse. And I will do that in a future episode, but pretty much any 8-bit era console that you think of. I'm talking Intellivision, Atari 2600, ColecoVision, Atari 7800, Sega Master System, etc. Whatever. It will work once you jailbreak it and load the appropriate core. The FPGA inside just reconfigures itself to whatever you want. The scaling and display options on this thing are ridiculously impressive too. 480, 720, 1080, PAL, NTSC, you can use scan lines, you can turn them off, you can enable or disable interpolation, you can crop the image if you don't like to see the flickering on the sides for scrolling action games. There are so many things that you can do with this. But to really put it through the paces, I wanted to use both the EverDrive N8 Pro and some of the Famicom imports that you saw in a video a couple of days ago so that I can test all of the functions from the most expensive cartridge I could put in it to a $1 Famicom pickup. I'm putting it through the bases just like I did the Super NT. 
Now, here's a little pro tip I learned from experience about using the bundled 8-bit Do controller for NES. The menu key that is on the controller is mapped to down and select. Now, if you have it mapped to the exact same combination in your EverDrive N8 Pro, you're going to get both menus at the exact same time when you hit the menu button, which is a little cumbersome if you ask me. So my personal preference is to leave it as down and select in the Analog NT Mini Noir menu. You can change it to anything you want, but I left it to the menu hotkey by default. But for the EverDrive N8 Pro, I changed the menu to up and select. If you want both menus at the same time, more power to you. I'm not telling you what to do. Or you could reverse it and have the EverDrive menu be the menu key and use a different hotkey combination for your Analog Mini NT Noir. I'm just telling you that since the 8-bit Doze menu button is mapped to down and select, that is your menu key by default. So if you have them both set to that, you get both menus at the exact same time. I had to fix that so I didn't get both of them because for me at least it was kind of a headache. I believe that Power Blade is one of those titles that has shot up in value due to the pandemic and Power Blade 2 probably has as well if not more so, but thankfully I collected a lot of the games that I labeled as my top 180 back in the 2000s. And by that, I simply meant all of the games that came in a series or had some sort of relation to each other. So Mega Man 1 through 6, part of the top 180. All the different variations of Super Mario Bros., Duck Hunt, and World Class Track Meet, part of the top 180. They don't have to be sequels, they just have to be related to each other or part of the same developed series by the same publisher. So this is one of the games that I have loaded in the top 180 and as you can see here it runs just fine. And one of the other advantages of jailbreaking your NT Mini Noir is that there is a ROM dumper so any of the cartridges that I have that I don't already have on my EverDrive N8 Pro I can simply dump them from the cartridge itself and either add them to the SD card in my N8 Pro or with the jailbreak, I can actually load the ROMs from the SD card slot itself. So you jailbreak it, you don't even need the EverDrive N8 Pro. At that point, it's kind of redundant, but for now, since I haven't jailbroken it, I'm still using it for the moment. I'll put it back in my top loader when I'm done with this anyway. Now that I think about it though, redundant may not be the right word because save states are an incredibly handy feature of the N8 Pro and I'm not sure if the jailbreak has save states or not. So I can still see this being useful if you want to save a game in progress and go back to it because unless you're a speedrunner, you're probably not finishing a game like The Legend of Zelda 2 in one sitting. I don't usually do that and... I frankly don't even want to be a speedrunner who finishes it in one sitting. I enjoy the experience from start to finish, and it's one of those games I always love coming back to because, for me, the charm of switching back and forth between the top-down view and the map and the side-scrolling action and the game has always been an enjoyable combination. I know back in the day when I was a kid, people bitched about it for not being exactly the same as The Legend of Zelda, but for me, it was a really nice change to the formula. All right, I think you've seen enough of the N8 Pro. Let's see what this can do with the Famicom slot, because I've got YY World 2 inserted into here. Just cleaned all of the cartridges, and now with the pins fully prepared, I'm ready to run it. Let's hit that button and see it go into action. Come on, oh, YY World, do your stuff. Show us what Konami's got. There it is. Famicom imports without using a Famicom cart converter. If there is one super sweet option that is absolutely standard to all versions of the Analog NT, whether it's the original or the Mini or the version 2, it's the combination of NES and Famicom slot because having that immediately accessible to you without having to plug it into a cart converter and as I used to have to do on my top loader, turn it around backwards so you can't even see the label. Well, it's just a pain in the butt to do that every single time, whereas you can just stick a Famicom cartridge straight into this thing and it just works. 
YY World 2 is one of those platforming games that is relatively unknown, except in Japan. But because collectors have figured out that it's a Japan-exclusive platformer and that you don't really need to know English to play it, the prices have slowly creeped up over time. It's not as expensive as Akamaju Densetsu 3 or Kid Dracula, but it's not a $1 game either. It's, it's in the lower end, but it is going up slightly as time goes by. So if you're looking at Famicom imports, games like Armadillo and YY World 2, you might want to get them while they're still relatively inexpensive because let me just be honest with you right now famicom games are so much cheaper than their north american counterparts same goes for super famicom and super nintendo you can get the exact same game except it's not localized into english and save a crap ton of money and if it's a platformer or a shooter then by god do it because if you don't need to understand the text and you just want gameplay, man, it is a life changer to pay those prices and not pay the North American prices. But anyway, here's Star Luster, which is only a dollar, so it's cheap no matter what. And I'm starting to wonder from playing it if this wasn't maybe localized for North America, because damn it, this isn't a really good game for a buck. You warp to an area of space where enemies are attacking your civilian human outposts and you destroy all the enemies with your crosshairs you move up down left right and circle around until you find them all it's a very star wars inspired game and it's a lot of fun and as far as i can tell there's no language barrier playing it of any kind you just shoot hit and move on to the next area of space it couldn't be easier this is a very good game to pick up as my friend Ryan mentioned in the comments section of my mail call pickups from Japan, Karataka came out on a wide variety of things in the 1980s, but in North America, the Nintendo Entertainment System was not one of them, although it did come out on the Famicom. Now, when I was growing up, I played a lot of this on the Apple II in the computer labs in my high school, and uh, I think we might have been using questionably obtained copies. We might have been using cracked copies. I don't remember for certain, but I know we got it from trading discs with each other, and we were playing it during school hours when we probably shouldn't have been, so I actually had to take the cover off the top of the Apple II and disconnect the sound card so that we could keep playing even when we were supposed to be doing schoolwork. Whoops! Now I can play it to my heart's content on the NT Mini Noir. Finally today, I'm showing off Armadillo because this is the source of many a ROM hack that exists out there. If you played a Famiclone that comes either with built-in games or a cartridge full of games and they have a bunch of sprite swap hacks on them, this is probably relabeled as a Mario or a Sonic game. Like, you'll see Sonic 3 or Super Mario 8, but it's really just Armadillo with the sprites changed to Sonic or Mario. It's a very interesting game. Not sure if I am or am not a huge fan of it yet, but you're platforming your way through the game and rolling up into a ball to take out enemies. And while you're in the ball state, you can bounce around a little. So it's kind of like Samus using the morph ball ability in Metroid, but not quite. I mean, I'll get more into this game over time, I'm sure, but for now, I just wanted to make sure that it works, and it does. I'm Mr. Mega Man Fan, and thank you for watching.